I'll bet you they will think any of those things. And I'm here to talk to you about paleo diet, and that has uh, stereotypes of its own, and they don't look very good either. Um, so, is low carb paleo? Um, not quite, because the focus of low carb diet on its own is just to focus on a quantity of a particular macronutrient, uh, carbohydrates, so the quantity generally trumps quality. Is paleo low carb diet? Possibly, because you're going to be eliminating most of the carbohydrates in our sort of processed society. But the um, eliminating, eliminating neolithic foods leaves you with the old foods and um, can you eat as much sweet potato if you want if you're a diabetic or can you eat as much honey as you want because that's technically a paleolithic food. So how do we combine these two strategies to get the both, best of both worlds? Um, I look at paleo slightly differently and I think the way to look at it is through an evolutionary prism. When people ask me how I eat, this is what I say, but then they look at me funny and they just go, oh, so I see it as a lifestyle and nutritional framework that relies on food high in nutrient value, appropriate to our species, and has its basis in evolutionary principles. And it's a mouthful. So most of the time people just glaze over and go, yeah, I eat paleo. Um, why is there a problem with it? And this is why I think we need to understand what, what evolutionary principles are. There is no single paleolithic diet. And uh, from the Inuits in the north to the Pacific Isles to Africa, people eat different foods even now. And obviously there are chronological differences. People who were living in the Ice Age ate quite differently to those who were living at warmer times. Um, and that's not even to say that this steak, the beef steak that you're having right now, is technically from a species that didn't even exist back then. So are you eating a paleo steak? Mm, maybe not. So I think being very dogmatic and saying, I eat a paleolithic diet, really opens you up to criticism. You have to realise that we're not just following the recipes in Rob Wolf's book, or Mark Sisson's book, or whoever book. Um, it's a, it's a guiding, uh, they're guiding principles. What's appropriate to our species? Wild animals eat a paleo diet. Once you get that concept, you go, wow, really? Um, and they're quite good at it. Um, amazingly enough, a lioness doesn't have to tell its cub that they need to chase that antelope for certain nutrients. There is no local pride nutritionist that tells them what to eat. And somewhere along the line, we lost that instinct that the animals still have. And zookeepers are generally quite good at recognising this, but sometimes they do get things horribly wrong, and that's when you hear about gorillas getting heart disease, which they don't in the wild. Evolutionary principles, and this is the crux of it all. What is evolutionary principles? Um, a bit of evolution 101. So the um, principle starts with an idea of natural variability. So the natural variability between the individuals of the same species can make you even more likely or less likely to survive in a given environment. There is always variability. Some people do it better, some people do it worse. Some microbes do it better, some do it worse. The ones that can develop uh, the ability to withstand an antibiotic survive. So when you apply the selection pressure, for example, antibiotic in that particular species, the ones who can survive with an advantageous trait till the reproductive age are the ones that get to pass it on. Once they, get the, once they pass it on, the lineage that accumulates that advantageous trait um, is overall better adapted to living in their particular environment. So it gets better adapted, it survives, it accumulates. A couple of caveats here. Um, you need to realise that evolution doesn't work from low order to high order. So we do not improve. There is no such thing as just getting better and better. Um, we adapt, and all the other species that adapt to the environment as it is right now. And a lot of times in evolution, you just uh, the adaptation is just a little tinkering, and it's an adaptation to an ever-changing environment rather than actual 
major change in the species line. And not all the adaptations are perfect. There are constraints in the evolution. One of the biggest ones, for example, for us, is the fact that our bipedalism gave us um, a huge evolutionary advantage. However, it came at a cost, and the cost is a narrow pelvis. Um, if we were to give birth to infants at the same level of maturity as other primates, we wouldn't be able to push them through the birth canal. God knows it's hard enough already. <laughs> and unfortunately, that means that we have to give birth to babies that are helpless in the animal world. And that's why we have evolved multiple physiological and also social um, adaptations to allow us to care for babies and children for much longer in animal sort of world. Although somebody probably needs to mention to Generation Y that 27 is probably the ceiling. <laughs> um, also, we have to understand that evolution hasn't stopped 100,000 years ago. It has been continuing. One of the latest um, uh, uh, sort of works of evolution that we know of is the lactase persistence gene. Um, as you know, lactase is an enzyme uh, that cleaves lactose, uh, and all mammals possess this enzyme which allows them to drink their mother's milk and uh, incorporate the energy from the milk. Normally, it disappears to the equivalent human age of about five. The introduction of domesticated cattle in about 10,000 years in Europe has given rise to a single mutation one single nucleotide polymorphism, one change that has given a lactase persistence and it has given a huge advantage to those individuals because it allowed them to utilise energy from the milk of another species at a grown up age. So they were able to survive longer, they were able to reproduce better. And uh, interestingly enough, this particular mutation um, Lactase persistence has also occurred in Africa and, and in other areas of the world, but it was coded by a different allele altogether. So that's an example of evolutionary uh, convergence, where the same trait has simultaneously evolved using different mutations. So you can tell how evolutionary advantageous that was. And in medicine, in traditional medicine, we talk about lactose intolerance as a disease. And if you look at it from the evolutionary point of view, it's actually the lactose persistence that is mutant. <laughs> it's mutant. Those of you who can drink milk, you're mutant. <laughs> and you can say that it's actually the lactose Intolerance is normal, and it is still normal in the huge majority of the population of the world. What about grain intolerance? Those people who can eat grains, what do you think about that? Maybe, yes, it could have been. So, how does it all revolve around medicine? So, we're here talking about the diseases of civilization. And if there was a natural selection, how come these diseases haven't been wiped out? How come they haven't been selected out? How come we're still sick, if not sicker than ever? And the, um, uh, a wonderful man, uh, professor of evolutionary medicine, Peter Gottman, in uh, University of Otago, calls them proximate and ultimate causes of disease. Uh, the proximate causes are the ones that we look at at conventional medicine. And we look at body as a machine, and when something goes wrong, we get a disease. Something just happened, the screw went loose, whoops don't know how, but the doctor is going to be a mechanic, the doctor is going to fix it. Um, if you look at it from the evolutionary point of view, you look at it slightly differently and you look at the body as the product of genes and a product of adaptation over millions of years and also with interaction of those genes and their environment today. And is it possible that disease has been an adaptation strategy and it requires a fair amount of trust in your body? It's good to ask yourself, why did this mechanism evolve in the first place? I'll give you a very simple example. You decide to give a talk at Brisbane World Cup down under, and you come up on stage and there are 200 people looking at you, <laughs> and your heart rate goes up, and your hands start to shake a little bit, and it's not a very nice feeling. But we all recognise it for what it is. It's a fight or flight response, and it's an intricate ancient hormonal system that has been designed to flood your body with adrenaline, and improve your cardiac output, 
but it's a nuisance. So currently, I'm very well adapted to the environment that I find myself in. I should be running from a tiger. Um, 